we, we have to stop relying on the language and the rhetorics of police brutality. Um, I, I feel like I've been saying this constantly, and I think a lot more folks are starting to hear it because they understand more deeply what I mean when I say that. It's not police brutality if the state sanctions the violence. At that point, you move from calling it police brutality to calling it policing. And if your problem is no longer that the police are exceeding the uh, alleged constrictions on their power, but are actually fulfilling it, right? But are, and not only that, are fulfilling it and pushing the boundary further in what the state will allow them to do. And that's what we're seeing now, right? When, when, when we have a proliferation of these, these cell phone video spectacles of cops shooting black people in the back as they run away from the cops with their hands up, and, and, and there's a question of whether or not that particular police officer will be held legally culpable. What you are talking about is, is a new form of police practice, which is also an old form of police practice. It's not police brutality, it's police practice. This is a pushing of the boundary of what policing actually is, of what the state will sanction. And, and here's the other part of this. In the rare instances in which individual police officers are in, in the criminological sense, in, in the legal sense, held culpable for committing violence and usually fatal violence against so-called innocent citizens. Um, and, 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 and activist communities want to celebrate that, right? What, what the mistake that, that's being made is a celebration of an exception to a rule. Um, and and the notion that that is somehow an execution of justice is a celebration that happens in complete ignorance of the fact that the line that was just drawn is temporary, right? The entire historical archive of policing, forget archive, the entire historical experience that black people, that native people, that border crossers, that queer people, that transgender people and so forth have with policing clearly demonstrates that what the police do is they are constantly experimenting with what the boundaries of police power entail. And not just, in term, not, not just fatal police power, but the everyday, uh, the everyday force, the everyday physiological violence, which, which, by which I also mean emotional, affective, psychological, um, and, and other forms of violence, which might not write themselves on your skin, but which write themselves on your body, on your soul. When, when we talk about the, the, the rare instances of, 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 of police being brought to justice, right, what we miss is the entire picture of what's actually unfolding in front of us. Now, having said that, the other problem that I think we have to confront is that when, when, we, when we think about the rise of different forms of mobilization and direct action against police violence, police brutality, policing, we need to ask the question all the time about why the fuck people think they need to go around hugging cops at these demonstrations. Um, I, I think it is worth constantly questioning in as acute a way as we possibly can why there seems to be this compulsory need to demonstrate one's humanity by demonstrating one's love for a, a person who inhabits an inhuman position. Because that's what policing is. I didn't say it was subhuman, it's inhuman, right? To have the power behind a badge to act as the agent of the state, to execute um, fatal violence on the basis of your own judgment is an inhuman practice. To inhabit that power is inhuman. And you know what, there's a lot of current and former cops that will tell you that, right? There's a lot of former cops who quit because they couldn't take living in, within, the, within the consequences of inhabiting that inhumanity for, for very long. And I include prison guards in that, right? So knowing that, part of what we have to question with, with current insurgencies is this, is, this, is this political script in which, you know, we, whatever we means, need to, declare the, the, need to declare and qualify that everything we do is not based on hatred of cops, but the fact that we love cops, right? And that what we're really protesting is them overstepping their bounds. Um, what, what, what would it mean to demand consequences of a different sort? 
which didn't uh, which didn't rely on the same state structure definition, racist state structure definition of justice and culpability and accountability that has given that position of inhumanity the, the, the street power to execute in the first place. Um, so this is to say that at the same time that we're beginning to hear languages uh, of prison abolition, gaining currency and traction, it's interesting that we don't necessarily hear the same languages being tied to the police, right? In fact, in fact, what I would argue is that the rise of a reformist and, and even allegedly abolitionist practice and discourse and analysis around, around criminal justice, prisons, jails, and so forth is actually being accompanied by a buttressing and amplification and a strengthening of policing. So, so in this moment, what, what I think I'd, I, I'd, I'd add to the argument is that there has to be an insistence on a discussion of both radical opposition to policing as an institution, as a form of inhuman power, and a police abolition, and what that would mean. And it's just as unthinkable, un, it's just as unthinkable now and unspeakable now as prison abolition was 15 years ago. So I think that's the, the, the shift in political culture that, that people need to push.